You know, Derek, he's the creator and host of Myth Vision Podcast. He interviews all the Bible scholars. Literally, I don't know if there's a Bible scholar on this planet that isn't going to at least one day be on his channel. Uh, and he has released a super popular documentary, The Real God of the Bible. And it is amazing. And we're going to be talking about it today. Welcome, Derek Lambert of Myth Vision Podcast. What's up, brother? <laughs> so initially, initially, this was called the Derek Knows Everything Christmas Special. And it still is in my in my heart of hearts. That is the, I told you, the, I don't like that name. <laughs> I really don't because there's already people who do think that about me. They really do think, oh, Derek thinks he knows everything. And no, I, I, I am enthusiastic. And I think that that comes off, of course, and people know that. But but the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. So, well, that's the joke, right? Because I, I didn't think anyone would think that you think that you know everything. Obviously, you just interview a lot of Bible scholars. It's just the amount of people that you interview and the amount of people that the amount of like content that you like dive into is just insane. Like, I you're almost doing like a PhD level, like. Well, you're not submitting assignments or anything, but you're just you're just in it. You're just constantly in it. You talk to anyone who's doing a PhD, and they're just like they're consumed by it. And you've been consumed by a incredibly wide range of ideas. And you're not an expert, obviously, nor am I. Um, but you get a broad perspective. And so when I was calling it the Derek knows everything Christmas special, it's like, what has Derek learned this year? Like, what is like has his perspective changed? Has it, like, uh, and I guess a lot of people don't understand the humor behind that. But it's I guess it's an Australian type of humor. But no, you don't know everything. But we're calling it the Derek knows everything special Christmas special, so we can learn what you've known <laughs> this year. Blame David. Blame David. <laughs> Blame David. Last year I told everyone that it was your idea. And you're like, no, it's not my idea. Um, oh, yeah, it's not. <laughs> so first of all, you've released this amazing documentary, The Real God um, of the Bible. Can you just tell people quickly what, like, why? Why did you release this? And like, why? It's blown up. Like, you've got like, what, 250,000 or 220,000 views in like four days or something? Yeah, um, almost 300,000 now. And I did it because, let's be honest, right? No one knows about this. And I'm not saying no one, but it is not the most commonly understood perspective about the God of the Bible. And many atheists who are engaging, and I'm atheist, agnostic, theist, anyone who really, I just use atheist because technically I am one. And so, you know, there's the, the community of people who are engaging with Christians they enter the arena arguing using the conception of God that they already have in their mind, and it's anachronistic. So it is not going back to the ancient roots and cultural historical context of this deity. And if we started doing that, not only would we be more sophisticated and understanding the human plight and how the human mind may have tried to wrap their mind around reality and the world we observe around us and then give attributes or give mm. anthropomorphic phenomena, like give the natural phenomena anthropomorphic uh, attributes that are like mm. human but much greater because no human can send a thunderbolt down from the sky. No human can make the volcano erupt or earthquake or water split or whatever you know you might be conceiving of. Snow from heaven, you name it. We see what Job, right? Um, but a god can. And I figure, you know, the most, I'd say one of the best books I've ever read on this was God and Anatomy by Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Oh, I got a signed copy. I got a sign. I paid all my pocket money to get a signed copy all the way from UK. It's amazing. That's awesome. She's amazing. It's amazing. She's controversial. She just goes and says what she thinks and she backs it up. There's so many sources and this isn't even an academic book. This is a popular book and it's got mm. tons of sources from Ugaritic texts to uh, just tons and tons of like comparative ancient Near Eastern deities. And then of course, lots of Bible stuff. And even the way that she translates, she'll tell you like, hey, this is a translation by this scholar, this this scholar, this scholar. If you go down into the actual, well, it's not, she doesn't have like a footnotes on the page, but when you go to the back, <clears throat> is it notes or index? Bibliography. You, 
Maybe it's not the yeah. I think it is in the bibliography. That's the most massive section that I don't is, think it's index. Yeah, is her bibliography as big as Dr. Josh Bowen's in um, did the Old Testament endorse slavery? Because that thing. Well, <laughs> let me grab <laughs> that thing is enormous. <laughs> enormous. Yeah, uh, Testament endorse. Where's this? <laughs> Bad boy, yeah. I, got all sorts I see, of I see, uh, I see either Josh or Megan in the chat, Digital Hamrabi. So I thought I'd give you a shout out. Uh, there's, there's also what I appreciate about Dr. As um, Derek leaves the stream, what I appreciate about Dr. Uh, Francesca Pullo is she uses um, this Bible here. Oh my gosh, is that there? It's like that big thing there is the Hebrew Bible as translated by Dr. Robert Alter. And she uses some of his translations or um, commentary, and it's it's really profound. It's, it's kind of say, saying a similar thing. She mentions uh, I looked up the reference, and he's talking about when God rested on the um, on the on the sixth day, on the seventh day. Sorry, he was it was because he was running out of puff, like he was exhausted. He was right. like, yeah, yeah, and and that's what Robert Alter was saying. And I'm just like, this is this is wild. Yeah, this is a much there bigger edition than this one. Um, for those, who oh yeah. I mean, it's a lot. I've more. only got the, I've only got the little edition at the moment, but I'm getting gonna get the big edition eventually. Um, but look at that thing! Look it's, at that thing! My wife's thrown it at me a couple times, and it's it works. Let me tell <laughs> you, it works. I'm I've been to the hospital, brain damage and all. So if you're looking for yeah. a weapon, it's, it's a good it's weapon. Per- well, let me ask let me ask you something, um, Derek. Is you said that you're an atheist? Is there anything? This is a question I had for later, but I'll ask it now. Is there anything this year that you've discovered that may have like softened your atheism a little bit, hardened it a little bit? Well, I use those words, but you know, do you know what I mean? Like, it's it, are you more are you less confident in your lack of belief? Uh, have any apologists come at you when when uh, Cameron Bertuzzi says, "By the way, God is perfect," do, are you like then now convinced that God is now perfect? Like, has any apologist hit you with anything that you're like, there might be something to this? Honestly, so I'm not fluffing. This is honestly, we could, we, we, we could be talking on the phone. As you know, sometimes I pick up the phone and I'm in a bath and you're taking a bath with me. David takes baths with me in case anyone's ever <laughs> so true. Like we so take true. Baths always, <laughs> every time fact, I call Derek, he's in the bath. You ever call me when I'm not in the bath. So, <laughs> it's, a, um, and it's so weird because like all of a sudden I hear Ryan's voice and Ryan's in the bath with you. She's just on the other side. of. We're the- all taking a bath. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and it's slip and slide. We're having fun, okay? But <laughs> on a serious note, no apologist has ever got me on Jesus. Anything biblical has ever swayed me or persuaded me. The only reason that occasionally, I wouldn't even call it like as if I, I'm now considering theism. It's really, I don't know. Let me put it like this. Humans, as far back as we have recorded prehistory have perceived these entities, deities, beings, etc., and have tried to model their world, their perception, reality, everything that we would consider from politics to how you wipe your butt to literally everything. We are pattern-seeking creatures. And so I look at all of this and I go, okay, every single one of them, every single model is man-made, human, constructed, not divine. That does not rule out that there couldn't be something behind or somehow there's something that me and my my risen primate on this planet perception just cannot perceive. So I do have that kind of like, hey, I don't know everything. We talk about this at the beginning of this episode, right? Mm. I don't know everything. But based on when they say, do you believe in God or do you think there's a God? And I look at all the models of God as we've understood them. I'm not convinced any of them exist. At the Mm. best you have is trying to equate God with nature. And then it's just like, because then you have to go, all right, you have randomness and selection taking place with evolution. And you're going, okay, well, why are things selecting things? We can all explain those naturally. But is there some mind, something metaphysically that causes nature in the universe to be the way that it is and it's not yahweh and it's not el and it's not jesus and it's not buddha and it's not you get what i'm saying so Mm. these are these are human things and so i don't know that answer 
uh, and so that's the only thing that I could say ever does, but it's never an apologist. Usually they're doing things in a way and not every one of them, but I just can't get over how I feel. There's so much dishonesty. They're driven not to get to the answer. They're driven to give you an answer. They want an answer and they're working toward making sure that answer is, is good. And everyone's on the same page. Hallelujah. All right. Tide, baby. Like there's, I know that experience of trying to yeah. make things true. And yeah. now I'm looking at actual scholars who are going, you know, let's be fair. What do you mean fair, Francesca? What do you mean, Dr. Stavrakopoulou? What I mean is, is we're dealing with a God in the Bronze Age. And this God in the Bronze Age is just so happens to be in the same region of the world that God's in Egypt, that God's in Ugarit, that God's in Mesopotamia, that God's all around here walk, talk, have sex, have kids, create with sex, all this stuff. And so mm. we're going to get to this God and we're supposed to have him some post-Platonic ultimate source of good outside space and time? That's absurd. That is not being honest with the data. We have to admit that's a later idea, thanks to Plato and those within the Greek world, impacting it. And so now we have a different perception of God, of God and Stoicism and Platonism in Christianity and the different various pagan cults and whatnot and philosophies that were going on ended up shaping the idea of God that we eventually nailed down. And that's that's just the honest truth. If they want to say, in some way, I can imagine a sophisticated theist going, our perception of the divine has also evolved over time. It just, you'd have to have a very loose interpretive model about God. And like the text can't be too serious about really it's just a humans in antiquity trying to understand it and really you might as well go so far as to say every culture is trying to describe it and one might have masculine and one might say it's feminine um it, one might have both male and female and they're just trying to understand it but there's something behind it all okay well yeah, i don't I, 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 about I know i'm, I'm this book sorry I'm into I'm interviewing um, Kyla, not so erudite, in a couple of days, who is a Christian, but right. she's a very strange type of Christian from my from my old perspective. Where you, like it's, it's it's exactly what it's it's it seems to be. She's very smart and she's very she's got a lot of faith. So it's it seems to me um, the way that she builds her worldview doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm looking forward to that conversation immensely because I just can't wait to. Like how? Where do you draw the line between fact and fiction? Like Noah's Ark, or you know, the, you know, what's the? I think you quoted it in your um, documentary, or maybe you didn't. But uh, you know, three days was Jonah in the belly of the whale, um, and so three days was Jesus in the belly of the earth. It's like, right. well, do Christians believe that Jonah was literally in the belly of a fish? This is you know what I mean. Man. No, because if they don't, if they yeah. go, no, he wasn't. Then it's like, well, then hang on. Well, then the verse is saying. Just as Jonah was in the fish, right? Jesus. So you're saying that Jesus didn't, or is that like where do you draw the line? This seems very ambiguous. It seems like you're just kind of picking and choosing, and that's interesting to me. Like because exactly. I don't think someone like Kyla, not so erudite, is a bad faith actor at all. I think right, they really right. believe what they. I'm not but, saying people who believe. I'm saying an apologist. They're defending something. That means they think something is true. And yeah. most of them have not honestly taken that naked approach of investigating, like comparing it in the actual context that it exists. They have started with their answer and then they mm. are working over time to get to their conclusion. That's what most yeah. apologists are doing. Uh, there's an, an analogy I thought of at, at one stage. It's like if you walk into a car, a car lot. The salesman there is never not going to convince you to get in the car. They're not going to be like, you know what? You don't need a car. You're, you're probably right with the car you have. They're gonna, they're always going to convince you. You don't like this car? What about this car? You don't like this car? What about this car? And they're always going to find. Do you like the climb cosmological argument? You don't like that one, brother? The teleological argument. What about the argument from divine hiddenness? What, no, you know, like that doesn't work. You know, they're going to, they're going to just be presenting ideas over and over again until they get one that sticks. But their goal isn't truth. Their goal isn't to find out whether or not you need a car. Their goal is to find, is to get you in a car. That's the goal. Right. And so they, they use, they, they have booklets on how to be the best salesperson they've got they've they got meetings on how to be the best salespeople. they've got you know and they do everything they can and that's i i also view apologetics like uh like that right uh 
but let's go right back. So I want to like go right into your documentary. You start the documentary is like with the the title "Dissecting the Divine." That's one of the first chapters. Right. Is it dissecting? Dissecting? Yeah, the I divine? think it's dissecting yeah. the divine. Yeah, yeah. Dissect, dissecting the divine. And I, I want to first like just pump the brakes and and just say like, where does God come from? Because we we have this, and I'm still confused. I've read the book. Mm -hmm. I've watched your documentary. I'm not the smartest man, but I know what love is. I, you know, like I, <laughs> that's a Forrest Gump reference, but where, from a consensus perspective, from a, from a biblical historical perspective, not a, like a theological Christian, like trying to make the worldview work perspective, but like right. history <laughs> from that perspective, where does like the God of it, where does Yahweh come from? You mentioned you know, maybe comes from L. Like, just, just tell us a little bit about okay, the, so the this roots. Is, so this is a that question is debated. Where Yahweh comes from, um, mm -hmm. most scholars consensus say from the south somewhere. Um, they would say probably Midian, uh, that from the Midianite people, potentially even Egypt. I've even heard some scholars say Yah is an Egyptian god. I mean, we're talking thousands of years BC. And so right. is this some Egyptian deity that found his wake? I mean, remember, Egypt ruled this territory mm -hmm. in that period. Bronze Age collapse. Egypt collapses. We have the Exodus narrative, the whole nine, all this stuff that takes place approximately in this period. Um, so, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, El is an Ugaritic deity from the Levant. So Ugarit. You can, we have tablet, we have actual clay tablets, like not copies of papyri that existed for centuries later after and we have to speculate and hypothesize and we have the tablets from Rosh Shamra in places of Ugarit that actually describe El and he's very human like like yeah. all of the other gods in fact you weren't going to find gods that weren't like having anthropomorphic traits they may even have animalistic characteristics but they were very down to earth, flesh and bone, physical, but they were bigger, better than the humans. And you even see some of this stuff carry on into the Greek world where uh, the old story of, of Odysseus, right? They're traveling. He, a, a goddess takes him to an island. She practically, for all intents and purposes, rapes him because uh, she's like wanting Odysseus. But he doesn't want her back. Now, he still does the do. But he, he doesn't desire her. He desires his wife and kids at home. And she makes a comment. So a lot of times you can understand the context of things by the details in a story. Even if it is myth, mm -hmm. the story tells you something about how the humans who wrote it perceive the deities. And she says something like, you know, am I not beautiful? Goddesses are more beautiful than any mortal woman. So she knows she's more beautiful than Penelope, than any woman on earth. The goddesses are prettier. The, the gods are way hotter, way more handsome. They look way better than the regular mortals. They're way stronger. So it's like a human multiplied that human times 10, 20, right? Size, strength, uh, the power that they have. And this is pretty much what you get. When you go back, you find anthropomorphic deities, that are very human-like. And what I love about Francesca's book, she says it and she's like, we're not reading this off mythical tablets. And she uses the term mythical because everyone who, if you bring this out to an apologist or someone who might be contentious toward this or people of a faith, oh, Mesopotamian stuff, come on, Ea, Inky, that's all mythical stuff. Where yeah. you do Garrett, go get the Rosh Shamar tablets, tablets. Oh, that's all mythical. Egyptian inscriptions. Do I need to go into that? We've seen the half animal, half deity, strange creatures and stuff and boner gods and the whole nine, right? I mean, it's it's there. It's I insane. love me a boner god. I had to bring up boner because we get we're we're gonna cover <laughs> we're gonna cover well, something. It's gotta happen. We, 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 uh, it's it's like a whole footnote in my notes. <laughs> like God, it says God's dick. That's what it says. But but, Dude, but let I me interviewed her. I felt a little bit like at first I was like, okay, I am, I am an adult and you are an adult. So how big is God's dick? I mean, that's pretty much, 
how That's the conversation amazing. went. And she's just like, it's enormous. It's, <laughs> And I'm like, okay, let's get into it. But um, <laughs> okay, well, that, well, um, <laughs> that I just want to make the, the point here, and she brings this up in dissecting the divine. Is, I think I'm pronouncing this right. Xenophanes is an old philosopher in Greece who pretty much made this statement, something of the effect, and I've heard that the source has been changed when people were copying or saying this is what Xenophanes said. But it's something like this: if horses could draw images of their gods. Their gods would look like horses. If dogs could draw images of their gods, their gods would look like dogs. Is it not? I mean, can we not at least see how ironic it is? Yeah. That the gods look like the humans who are telling you about them, and nobody pauses for one second with common sense and really asks the question Is it possible that the gods are actually made in the image of the people and not the other way around? Yeah. It's That's my so you have uh, the, the more I think about this, the more wild this is. And I think I was talking to um, my beautiful mother who about this this very thing, and uh, and she's in the process of kind of looking and everything. Like she was a very f strong, faithful woman for a long time, and is now like she's been watching deep drinks and I've corrupted her soul. But um, no, but but we've been looking at this and we're talking about this. But it's like you know, think about this. An all powerful, as all like, all powerful, all knowing, all loving God, right? Who gets angry, who gets jealous, mm -hmm. who feels hatred, who feels love, who thinks about things. Well, what's what what would God have to think about if he knows everything? Right. Um, smells things, like creates things. Like these are all things that are very human. You know, that's that's just describing a human. Like, and and it it's, it goes even further into, into this. It's like god has a son it's like we'll get we'll go into this but it's like if god has a son like how did he have that son like does he need a wife like um, like you know right. what i mean like if, if, if we're made in god's image and we need uh, you know, we, we need a partner to make children like right you know I mean? but but back to al is this al so i've seen this image pop up a lot yes uh that's so l. that's l okay and so l when did so did l get it kind of adopted by the um israelites i would the, say that the israelites are canaanites canaanites, and canaanites yep. who are from the region of ugarit i mean yep. not all israelites may have been canaanites but whoever ad adopted becoming an israelite or joining the israelites as however that happened and there are various theories that are really good interesting ones on how israel formed but from this region you can go ahead and bank on it that El was the primary chief deity of these people who already existed in this region at this time. And so that's why the name continues. Some want to try and like chalk it up to it's just a title. I'm not saying that it hasn't been used in that way, but no, this is an actual God whose name was El. But oh, this, this, so this look at, look carefully, notice something, go all the way down. Look, I want you to pay some notice his feet. What's he wearing? Sandals. Sandals. Most people have no clue, but I even showed in that documentary something from her book, which she has, I think she has images in the actual book, but in the documentary about the sandals, the feet of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, I think it was, who conquered the people. And they show his sandals. I show them in the documentary. Yeah, they're here. It's um, a pair of... Oops, a pair of Tutankhamun ceremonial sandals manifest in the king's power to trample his opponents using conventional visual motifs. The insoles depict the trusted up bodies of the trust up bodies of Egypt's traditional foreign enemies framed top and bottom by their dis disabled war bows. And I mean, they the god crushes the enemy underfoot. The enemy is their footstool. All of that language is anthropomorphic. Real kings, real human kings, really trampled on the enemy, and they considered that crushing them under their feet. And so did the gods. So That's there's so many so things. Is this, could someone technically argue in some weird way that this is one of the first images of God? Yes. Of the God of the Bible. I mean, it's one of the oldest existing, uh, I guess you'd say, images 
that we would have. I'm not sure it's the oldest, but it's one of them that is actually showing you a visualization of L, uh, along with several other models like this. I mean, there are some that look like this. I'm not sure about their datings, but yeah, this is like the oldest examples that you can show. Someone and mentioned I, that it looks yeah. like Elf on the Shelf, and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I said to Megan Lewis when she was on with me and um, <laughs> me and uh, Josh, Joshua Bowen. I was like, they feel like they're playing dolls. Like, and there <laughs> is some truth to that. Mm. Mm. I wonder if... Yeah, I wonder how I wonder how many of these like rel world religions and ideas and, and philosophies start as literally as, as as small as like dolls. You know what I mean? Like I wonder, or or just like a, a bedtime story that Dad told, you know, when we were uh, around the fire. Like I wonder, I wonder how many start that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I I imagine it it wasn't like just made up. I think that it all. If we look at things naturally as humans. Look at examples of like auguring in Rome. Birds fly in a certain direction and the human has a superstition that if the birds go that way, then the next three months are going to be bad. Or if the birds go this way, like we, we connect mm. patterns that don't exist in ways. And I imagine how these deities and their systems arise and the way that humans construct is modeled off the human perception the human mm. existence and how we experience things. So it just so happens even today, and as advanced as we like to think we are, no matter who they are, someone might go, I'm being dealt a horrible hand in life right now. Well, they might go speak to a shaman in South America. They might go and talk to um, some palm reader, or they might actually go to church and ask God, what is it? Like, I think that the human has always tried to get to the unknown and in the much bigger than them and not understanding what this is and kind of the God of the gaps idea, like in trying to seek out something there. And so this is my personal thoughts. And I think that many other people who are naturalists like me would say the evolution started gradual and it, and it started from ways of like assuming things are in the bushes there. Or why, why is there lightning in the clouds or, People are going to ask, where do you go when you die? Because humans naturally, when they die, one of the most common things is they hear or experience their loved one and they've been gone for years or mm. months. So how do you explain that they heard them or they might even see them either hallucinating or in a dream, which I would consider a form of hallucinating. And so they're experiencing their loved one and they, they go, they're alive. I just experienced them. I just woke up and talked to mom and I can relate to that. That's another reason why as an atheist, I'm not like so bashing because I can, I, I love my mom and mm. I want to be able to say, I told my mom one day you're going to be gone, mom, and I'm going to be talking to you. And I know you're not going to be talking back, but I'm going to be talking to you. You were important to me. And so it'll be irrational, but it's okay because you're my but mom. It, it, it's amazing how we can know it's irrational, but it can still cause um, comfort. This right. is this is super weird, but like I've been anxious um, of, of uh, a little while ago. I was anxious and I asked chat GPT. I was like, this is what I'm anxious about. Comfort me. And it comforted me. I read what it said. And I knew it was from, from a machine. And I was like, you know what? That actually makes me feel a lot better. Thank you. And I, and I went to sleep like, right. and it's like, I knew it was like just a machine. It's just irrational. Like, but it made me feel better. Like, and it was, it's, it's crazy. Like uh, it's, uh, it's really crazy uh, that we can know that. And we, but right. our, our emotions and our intellect are very separate. I feel like they're like two parts of the brain. Uh, so going back to L, L gets developed, gets developed into, um, uh, into, into the picture of the and when does Yahweh like kind of pop up from there? Like where where do where do we first hear about Yahweh? Where does Yahweh come from? Well, that's the that's the debate. Is this the same God as the one from Egypt named Yah? Is this because we hear of Yahoo? We hear of Yah, um, something to that effect. I'm pronouncing it how I've been told and how I've heard it, but I'm sure there are several other ways to try and pronounce this. Um, we eventually in the Greek see how they translate it and they say Yahweh or Yahweh or Yahweh, something to that effect. 
But mm -hmm. this God, wherever they came from, whether Midian, Egypt, somewhere in the south, could have been Arabia for all we know, um, has been, I guess you'd say, somehow involved or in in has been absorbed into the pantheon at Ugarit, this mm -hmm. deity named El that has 70 sons. And his wife was named Asherah, or at that time it wasn't Asherah. Her name was Atherat. And it become, which is the etymological like root to Asherah is what I'm hearing in the book. And if it's not etymological, it's definitely linguistically tied to it. So mm -hmm. I think it's etymological though. I'm not the linguist expert. I'm just reading it based on the scholars. I'll call and, Matt, Matt Munger up. Yeah. If he was here, he'd be able to correct me or Joshua Bowen or Kip Davis. They might actually know this better than like at least be able to, but they know I'm on the right track here. And this God and his wife, who's also kind of depicted in the, Ugaritic material as also a ruler of the heavens and the cosmos. She also rules over the waters. No, what do you mean waters? Like waters were well established to be chaotic and to be, you know, the dragon, the, the, the serpent and not Satan, which later becomes how we view, you know, the serpent, um, the actual chaos dragon, Tiamat, right? Uh, what, what the Genesis demythologized word is to home the deep, um, uh, that chaos dragon, she ruled over it as well and, and conquered in Ugarit along with El and they have children and Yahweh ends up being one of those sons. And we have that in Deuteronomy 32 in the Bible. We have El Yon, the, the most high. When he apportioned the nations, dividing them up, pretty much giving a deity, one of his sons, rulership over the 70 nations, one for each, he gave Israel as an inheritance to Yahweh. So Yahweh was one of the lesser gods who received this people called Israel. And um, that is spelled out in Deuteronomy. It's... Without a doubt. And it's polytheistic. No matter what Michael Heiser and them want to try and tell you that it's not. Yes, all of these deities play a role. And it, and it just shows how polytheistic it was. There's several people who have written tons on this. But it eventually moves towards something like a henotheistic worldview. But mm. what's, what's the major difference? I'm saying if you're saying polytheism is all gods are equal on the same level. Well, no. Obviously, there's a chief deity. If that's the case, then Mesopotamia is not polytheistic, but we know it is. And so there are different ranking deities above others and lesser deities, and this is the biblical worldview. Mm. Is it, it's it, it used to always interest me when I was back in church that the Bible says, you know, those who talk to the dead or those who try and talk to the dead or, or like it's it, they forbid talking to the dead. As if you can actually talk to the dead, mm. and like the or you know, I, I shall have no other gods before me. Not not idols or not like statues of things that aren't real, but gods. Right. The yeah. the Bible seems to argue, at least in the early um, in the early scriptures, that other gods actually do exist. Right, but they're just so. But I don't get that from a Christian church these days. There's there's one true God. And every other God is just like not real, you know, what I mean? like, or not like just fake, you know what I mean? But, but With the Bible that. seems, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, about like where, like from we, because the, the Bible seems to move from polytheism to a monotheism perspective. Well, mm -hmm. actually it starts pretty monotheistic, um, but it's got its roots in polytheism. But can you talk a little bit about that, that, that gradient? Well, I would say there are places where it is clearly Hino polytheism. I mean, with a chief deity, just like Marduk was the chief deity and other gods. Um, and that polytheism or henotheism ends up eventually becoming to certain scribes later a way to push out these other gods from view or even make these lesser gods into other things like angels or trying to 
remove deities in one place it almost sounds like there's only one god and it is our god and all the other gods are fake people have interpreted these things this way so there's this transition between what we would call henotheism to pure monotheism and that there are no other deities but what the problem with that is even the new testament has at least the worldview open to having the other deities there Paul even has demons, right? These lesser gods that are ruling this world. Even Ephesians hints at the ruler of this, this world is Satan. Now, this is by the time, second, late Second Temple Judaism, by this time, Satan, uh, Azazel, various demons have become the Satan, the serpent. They've kind of fused chaos and the devil and made this evil um, become this ruler satan um that still keeps evolving down into the christian age but the gods become angels and they become like these little divine in between things but they're not gods don't call them gods they they want to get away from even having anyone potentially competing with the deity that they worship mm -hmm. and that's really what you find it gets it gets extreme when you get into islam how far they want to go with monotheism uh, that when you start bringing up, what about demons and like jinn and things like that? What are these things? Uh, they have to be, they're not deities. They can't be gods. And whenever you read about some of their, I'll call them myths because they have a uh, paganism before Islam comes in with Allah, um, how all of these pagan myths end up getting defeated and overcome because the light of the truth of Allah comes in and squishes all these evil things. We see that happen. It, 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 uh, the Christian church had ideas about going into a cave. One of the early saints would go into a clay, cave of a pagan world for hundreds of years. He slept like hibernated and then he wakes up and the world's Christian. All of a sudden it's Christian. The same yeah. idea happened with Islam and stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm playing. Um, I just started playing through Skyrim again. I'm not sure if you ever played the video game Skyrim. Yeah. Uh, Elder Scrolls. Yeah. And, and been watching Game of Thrones and just, the how accurately i never picked this up the first time but how accurately those games and that the, those tv shows got religions where it's like my god's real and it's like your god's real. like you worship the old gods ah, i worship the old gods and the new i screwed like and it's just like yes like, damn dude like it's just so accurate like so and it's just like or like even in the game of thrones where it's like the, the you know the big you know the divine the seven or whatever and it's like that you know they bought the big um cathedral like cersei plays up the cathedral it's like and it's like everyone's a sinner but we gonna force everyone not to sin it's like it's just so accurate of like religious right. movements and cults and like it's just so spot on 100 like you could... no you, the <laughs> game that i one that i enjoyed was uh, uh the uh fallout 3 did you ever watch that the post post-apocalyptic game where you're in like a bunker at the very yeah. beginning when you come out into the world one of the first towns you come to they call nuke town because there's this nuke that dropped but never blew up and yeah. all of these people sit in this very radiated water around the nuke and like worship it. And there's a church and you walk in and there's like, they literally are like the people of the light. And you can do a side quest in the game where you actually can, there's a couple paths you can take, right? Disarm the nuke and like these nut jobs that are over here, like worshiping this, this nuke of light that will bring the truth and eradicate all wickedness and things like that. Um, you can go and actually blow it up. And if you do that, then you'll hear these rumors out in the world as you go along in your speeches that kind of hint at the truth of the light from the East did take place. And like, like it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I do remember that. I remember that nuke town and everything like that's So, and I remember that was a big decision. Like I can blow up a whole town. Like that was so cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, like the morals, there's morality. There's the whole nine in the game. And it's just like oh, man. You had, uh, Skyrim. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've got, you know, I'm a, um, I'm an indie game, I used to be an indie game developer. So like I was right into the video games for a long time. And so much of game, game theory has like moved into like philosophy. And it's, it's actually really wild um, how much it intersects. But um, so we have El, we have Asherah, we have, you know, Yahweh, we have the, but God is said to have made us in his, his image, mm -hmm. which means that arguably, uh, if he made Adam in, in his image, is that, um, Adam would be 
that God would have a penis, legs, you know, arms, um, biceps, um, could work out and get bigger, could uh, not eat and get smaller. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it even, you know, there's a big question. And you know what? Let's just go straight to the dick. But like, because that's what everyone wants. Everyone <laughs> wants God's dick. <laughs> that sounds very blasphemous. I didn't mean it like that. But uh, was Adam circumcised? That was a big question. Right. For for, uh, for a long time in um, was it uh, Judaism or is it like later in Christianity? But it was a big question because if God, if if circumcision was uh, a way of being worthy to, I guess, be with God, be God's chosen people, right? Um, and and Adam was made perfect. Was he circumcised? It, like, is God circumcised? So. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, isn't it interesting that, that that the Jewish interpreters who were looking at this knew what it meant to be in the image of God? And for those mm -hmm. who didn't know, like modern Christians who act like this means that we're not, this has nothing to do with us looking like God in any physical sense. Um, the word for image in Hebrew, and I'm no linguist, but I know about a, you, you can check the same book a few chapters later, and it tells you Genesis 5 verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, and notice it's the same guy who was made in the image of God. He had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Mm. I mean, we're going to pretend like the word doesn't mean he looked like Adam. Uh, the, he models, he, he has a son that's just like him. And in, by the way, in biblical, in the biblical world and antiquity, and I'm sure it's more than just those in this region, the man um, conceives, the women just carry, they're just vessels. So they imagine that the seed of the man is actually what makes the child. And like the woman just somehow is like putting it in the oven for nine months and like, oh, but if a woman can't get pregnant, right? There's a whole lot of weird stuff that goes into this. But if the woman can't get pregnant, it could be a demon a female demon tell me there's not some misogyny going on in antiquity here that like the bible and misogyny no no i know Rubbish. <laughs> why am i i'm trying to refuse the truth of of, of jesus yeah here. what sin do you love so much why do you hate right. god derek right i you know um yeah uh, i don't know um but, <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, <laughs> you get the point about the image yeah. as far as the penis goes and i had to just make that point Notice the rabbis need to come up with, was Adam circumcised? Because they need God to also be circumcised. Because they want the idea of circumcision to match the deity. And they've rationalized saying, yes, he was. The reason that they say that he was, and I'm looking in here, was this in Dissecting the Divine or was this in his Grounded? I can't remember exactly. Oh, no, this would well, be in the section, right? Let, people have asked, and um, it's it's linked in the description. Let me just quickly share this tab. What is this? That? Is your docu it, this is your documentary. Your documentary. Yeah. We're, we're talking about the real God of the Bible. This is your super popular documentary. How many views is it at now? Two hundred seventy-five thousand views in like yeah, five days. Right. It oh. is three hours of just, just. Let me just say this. I deliberately didn't message you after I saw this. Because I wanted to say this on stream, but you have found your stride. The way you talk in this, the way you um, present the ideas, like it is perfect. Like you. you're, you're, you've really come. Like, like your other documentaries are, are fucking amazing, but this right. takes up another level. Like, I told you really this good. Was my best one, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you did, <laughs> and I was just like, okay, okay, everyone's documentary is the best. Like the newest documentary, it's like when right. a when a band releases their new album and they're like, oh, um, and it's like, what's your favorite album? And it's like the new one. The new one's the best. It never is. But this always, really is. Always <laughs> outdoing myself. <laughs> yeah, this actually is like your best, and this is like, it's just so fascinating. It's I'm gonna watch it over and over again because it it it, it does such a good job at covering. Um, Dr. Francesca Stravacopoulos' work, uh, because that's that's essentially a source text. It's right. going over God and anatomy in in a con kind of condensed form. But for anyone, it's in the description. Just so you know, I found the section. It's in perfection oh, awesome. the penis. And in okay. this section, I'll just read what I put in the script here. Today, we might think this question is silly, but the ancients thought it was serious. Did God create Adam circumcised or not? The answer would tell us as much about God's penis as it would Adam's. 
I know, I know. You might be saying, Abraham was the first guy to get snip snip of the old, uh, the old foreskin. But in fact, similar language describing Noah as tamim, which just means he's worthy to walk with God as a whole or unblemished person. So rabbis had clever ways to solve these problems. How about Adam, though? They say he was born from the earth in the image of God, so of course he was circumcised. This notion has ancient roots, as Francesca expresses. And then she goes in and says, God's direct forerunner, the late Bronze Age deity El, appears to have undergone circumcision in a ritual preparing him for marriage and sex with the two goddesses he encountered at the seashore. Remember the one where he masturbates, his, gets an erection to heaven? And then these two goddesses are like, oh my God, look at your PD. I want to, I want to like mess with it. And then he takes them back. And next thing you know, he knocks up two goddesses. Atherot was not so happy. It seems um, with this whole idea of just bringing in these new goddess chicks who are now getting him, you know, babies and all that. I'm just saying that this is the world you're looking at when you're reading this yeah. stuff. So in this Ugar Ugaritic myth, El sits enthroned, equipped with the phallic symbols of old age and infertility. In his hand, the staff of sterility. In his hand, the staff of widowhood. El's reversal of the lifelessness held in his hands is revealed in a ritual asserting his sexual fec fecundity. His foreskin appears to be removed and the wound wrapped by ritual specialists associated with a careful cultivation of sacred vineyards those who prune the vine pruned him. Those who bind the vine bound him. They let his tendril fall like a vine, like a budding vine clipped into fruitless or fruitfulness. So El's circumcised penis brings forth children in his new marriages. And notice something. As soon as he tells Abraham to circumcise in this whole picture, circumcise and all this, he tells him, you will be fruitful and you will have you will have a seed, the number of, you can't even count, the stars mm. of heaven and the sand of the sea. Like you are about to have so many freaking kids, Abraham. He circumcised, so this is a, a fertility. It seems some type of cultic fertility practice that the idea of if I circumcise, probably is going to help them have um, magical seed that'll make them have more children and offspring. But um, he had a son, according to, according to a priest named Sanko Neathon, or something to that effect, Eusebius in the 4th century is quoting Philo of Byblos in the 1st century, who was able to translate the ancient Phoenician language, Canaanite, into Greek. So he's Hellenizing it, but he's bringing the names of the god, El is one of them. He has a son named Yedud. It's literally I E D O U D. I mean O U D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I E D O U D. He's his only begotten son who El sacrifices and then circumcises his penis. So, mm. like you have the myth of Abraham in this ancient Phoenician. God named El, who sacrifices his only begotten son and then turns around and, and uh, circumcises his dick. It's, it's interesting the significance of circumcision from a um, like perspective that it's, it's the thing that makes you worthy. Like it's the, it's the thing that's like, now I'm part of God's people. And yep. there's this amazing cartoon like book that came out uh, I don't know what the book's called, but here's an, an image that kind of went viral. It's a children's cartoon, a little graphic, but it is a cartoon. So just uh, trigger, trigger warning. But it's called The King of Foreskins. Is this <laughs> in a children's book? No way. I love oh, it. It's boy. like... This is a kid book? <laughs> so I, I think it's a parody. I think they have all the horrible stories from the Bible drawn with really happy cartoon figures. And it's like, his daughter's hand in marriage. King... Um, King Saul wanted no less than 100 Philistine foreskins. David really wanted to become a son-in-law to the powerful king, took his men and killed enough Philistines to bring back 200 foreskins. Yeah, David yeah. counted them all in front of the king as promised as he uh, as uh, he was awarded the princess. And just look how happy he is. He's like, here are your foreskins, sir. It's like oh. a big sack. Dude. <laughs> I know, it's like, 
I saw that and I was like, why didn't I think of this first? Like, imagine that. Imagine a book of just all, like, religious texts, but done in, like, a cartoon children's book kind of way. Like, it, that's, it, hilarious. that's hilarious. That's, so that's hilarious. Yeah. But, but why? So, so from a theological perspective, uh -huh. why is the foreskin? Go back into your Christian mindset for a second. Like, let's, okay. let's go back to Derek Seven YouTube channel or whatever, whatever, like, whatever the you know, your old Christian YouTube channel. If I was talking to Christian Derek, what is the importance of the um, foreskin, like removing the foreskin? Why is that a thing? Well, it would have been something either spiritual at the time, or it would have been that God knew ahead of time that somehow this would, in our excuse, be more hygiene, uh, cleaner, because anyone who's have, ha had children that are boys, uh, you know, you got to pull back the foreskin and clean around there every day. If you mm. don't, you will, it, it will build up, um, it will infect and then you can have a problem and that can create a bit. So this was my mind says it like, Hey, uh, notice these people are doing this because that was what I would have probably said. Now I know mm. it's not that, um, I it's, it's definitely in the vein of fertility and also in the vein of, I would say like a right to becoming, mm one of the righteous, one of the just in that cultic environment. Because if you look carefully at some of the priestly writings or some of the later stuff, you'll notice that men, I'm, this is going to get funny. So if you're a girl, please forgive me. I'm just talking Bible here. So um, also let me, let me just say this. There's so many times in the documentary where you're like, I can't mention this on YouTube. Yes. I might get my channel demonetized or whatever. Yep. Mention them here. I'm re we're ready to sure? risk it. If it's well, just let use, me be careful with what I say because I don't be careful with what you say. Use 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 the terms like grape and I'll try. Yeah. I won't use yeah, that yeah. word. I'll you'll okay. know what I mean. I'll use adjectives to yeah, describe yeah, yeah, the yeah, word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because this so gets, we're just talking Bible. Look, it yeah. gets real, real dark. Um yeah. and she points out like Yahweh, according to some of the books, Hosea, you have it in other places as well in the prophets, but uh, come back come back to that for one second just to point out yeah. if you were going to be anyone in a priestly setting someone who's going to be significant which means you're closer to god you're going to be closer to god you have to have your nuggets nice and tight you're you're you have to gird up your loins underneath your loincloth you have to have your nuts nice and tight they cannot be free dangling around god does not like that also, you could not have just had sex and enter into these sacred spaces. Uh, or the night God. before, if you're dripping from fluids, um, you're not you're not uh, kosher to enter into these places. Okay, this is also getting into everything. In a way, it's like a cleanliness thing because if you go to Qumran, many of the Jews in Qumran. They had special places they went to defecate, number one. Number two, when they went to defecate, I'm going to impersonate it. You're lucky if you get to see this. Dude, they would cover their behind with a white, like a white loincloth while they went to poop so that God did not see their, their rear ends while they pooped. They, they hid it from God's view because they respect God so much. It reminds you of the passages where the seraphim are covering themselves with their wings and they're in the presence of God. And she says in the book, I think this is Isaiah or Ezekiel, somewhere in Ezekiel. I don't have all this. Like I didn't come prepared to go through all of yeah. it. It's all in her book yeah. and in my documentary. I mentioned some of this, but is her point is, is they're covering their, their feet, but the feet are a euphemism for the penis. And here are these seraphim with dicks that are covering their dicks in the presence of the almighty dick, gods in the temple. And his dick filled the temple. And it's, I know, I know. Wait, we got it. So there, there's a scripture. Is it Isaiah or somewhere? It's like, it's like someone's got to, got to have a scripture. We've got to read that scripture because when you read it, just like in church, or whatever it, 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 you just don't get that bad idea. But when you look into the to the um, language and to like what it actually means, does anyone know the scripture that we're talking about? Do you know the scripture, Derek? It's like you, that you're talking about the the, the one that like she it, it, mentioned. It, it fills the temple, like it, like it's it's it talks about his dick, God's 
It said, yeah. I think it's my possession is Rogue. Um, um, oh, man, let me was scroll it? up because I've got it in here. I just got to find it in my script. <laughs> Someone help. Because it's, it's, um, it's, it's crazy because you, you, if you read this, uh, and this is what I love about, about religion is since I've actually left religion is it's so much more interesting. <laughs> Isaiah 6, someone said, okay, it's so much more interesting. Uh, not just from a, like a, we're laughing and stuff now, but like, like this, this is interesting to look at like what was important. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking for it and to be very honest, should be, maybe it's in the foot section and not the penis section. I don't know. Cause I thought it was in, in the penis. She has like four sections on there's genitals. There's, um, let me make sure I got this right. That's footloose genitals. I try to follow the, the outline of her book, phallic masculinities, uh, perfecting the penis. And then there's uh, uh, divine sex, and that might be where it's at. I don't know. No, that's where you get, she gets an Asherah, Hathrot. Ah, uh, here we go. Verse uh, Isaiah chapter six, verse um, one. In the year of King uh, Isaiah, Uzziah, Uzziah, uh, in the year the King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high mm -hmm. and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Right, and she argues that that's not that that's a euphemism, mis, uh, euphemism, euphemism, euphemism. Right. Oh my god. For, a euphemism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For the penis. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah, why, I don't the, know where it is. Where it is in the. Um, I know Dan McClellan has covered this. Dan McClellan points out that he says this is an this is an interpretation that there are a couple of other people he mentioned that also think this, and then there are some who don't. Right. There's some who don't. There's some who want to try and argue, no, this means this. Or this has to do with this has to do with his actual train, his actual robe, or his actual um dangly parts of the ro robe or whatever. They they want to take that approach. Even this, it's like, why does God need a robe? Why? Like it's just it seems it seems so human like it is. why does god like is he protecting himself from the elements is he trying to exalt himself among like what's the purpose if he's the most exalted why does he have a robe why is he cover like it i i just it just seems all too human to me um well, it, it is and they will later allegorize or find symbolic spiritual ways to interpret stuff like this they i mean even we read the genesis account god mm -hmm walks with adam walks with him he walks with abraham he talks with him it's not like some strange you know you read it and it says what it looks like and it looks like what it says and it's he's walking and talking with god normal he calls out to them he asks Later, they are. christians look back and they interpret it for example in the garden remember where he hides because he's afraid of god mm -hmm. um god, he hears god walking up the text says like he can hear God's footsteps later on. Christians interpreted this and they're like, is it God's feet? Actually? No, no, it is. It is the, the gospel of Christ walking ever so closer to Adam. Like they have allegorized and spiritualized all of this and lost all of the original context. They completely destroyed that, that ancient, understanding and that's it, really the case so why does god get angry why does god have a nose why does god have feet why does god have a dick why does god have a wife why does he have children why does he sit on a throne like every other human king that rules sits on a throne and needs a crown and needs a robe and needs a throne and needs a footstool and has you know a, a divine right arm that's strong just like marduk's just like some of the deities in egypt just like some of the human deities called pharaohs that ruled in mm. real places on planet earth that's because it walks like a duck it talks like a duck it's a freaking duck it is a <laughs> it is an anthropomorphized deity this this the bible tells us this right what i mean is is when you're looking because the bible doesn't tell us anything but when you're reading it this is what it looks like and the best yeah. proper way to understand this is to use a heuristic approach comparing it to literature from the same region at the same time and the surrounding cultural regions to see if we see any similarities at the same time. And wouldn't you know, we get the same stuff. I mean, 
in our Bibles, we get hints of God having sex. We get hints of him in the act of the R-A-P-E word that we aren't going to say on YouTube with Israel. And that section got so bad, I erased my script several times trying to make that section for this documentary, David. It it gets real. Can real. You, do you have do you have part of that script that you can like kind of talk about a little bit? Yeah. This is, the, this is myth vision uncut after hours. Uncut only fans watch <laughs> out. Um, bigger, longer, uncut. I know, right? So let me see in the book here for a second because I know that what, what I cut what, out. So it's not and in genitals. Let it's me just shout out to the book is linked in the description um, and, and it's part of the, the recommended reading, but it's linked in Derek's links as well. Go check it out. It's an amazing book. Uh, the audio is done. Um, audio version is done itself. Incredible. And, and of course, um, another thing, if um, people are um, uh, wanting to, they just can't get enough of this stuff, you can go check out um, MVP courses um mvp courses are doing some you guys are doing some really awesome stuff um you guys have made me an affiliate which is super sick so if you use the links in the description here um it helps me it helps this channel out but dr robin welsh um dr robin faith welsh is coming up with a class and there's some really awesome classes up there but uh go check out mvp courses and derek back to you what have you found okay i found it are y'all sure you ready i'm just gonna read it man okay I'm just, just gonna read it, it. Is everybody in the chat ready? If you're ready right now, two things I want to see. Give press one if you liked this stream, and if you're ready to hear what this is, what this says. I want to see ones sure. in the comment section from oh, our oh, followers oh, oh, oh. here that are that are following us because I want to know if they really want to hear what it says. I want to see. I want to see. So I'm waiting. Let's, let's do this. I'm waiting to see some of these, uh, some of them, some of the people watching to let us know. Press one awesome. in the comments, please. Okay, we got. I we wonder got if we. Soul Rebels, I, Carrie. Kill, I killed I Earl. Mr. Wallace says he's ready. J and M Cannon. John D. Okay, yep. You need to. John D, get ready for that course. AR, Grand Pong, William Farner. I hope I'm saying that properly. Marcos. Um, Courtney. Callan. All right, Maxwell. Okay, cool. All right, we got some attention. And I put on, I put, I put on some relaxing um, reading music, but this is the same similar style of music that you use in your documentary. Okay. So it's just in the background, just slightly, so everyone can just enjoy as we. I'm going to try to make it as soothing as it can be with this very difficult, but it starts off good. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. In the Bible, however, God's most significant and sexualized relationship is not with a goddess or a goddess-like figure, but with his other wife, Israel. The personification of a city, territory, nation, or social group as a woman is well attested in often masculinist patriarchal cultures across the globe. But in the biblical text, the female personification of Israel plays a sustained and crucial role in articulating the intense and exclusive relationship between God and his worshipers. It is a relationship so intimate. And I just want to pause and say, notice how they're feminine. The worshipers, his people, Israel, are feminine. This this leads into the bride of Christ. I mm. always wondered as a Christian, am I going to be his wife? Because, you know, we have this binary world as, as staunch fundamentalists. And it's like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm the husband of my wife. I'm the man in this relationship. Does this mean Jesus is going to do me when I'm his wife? Like I would think of all these things and it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand it, but you can see all the way in the old Testament or Hebrew scriptures. So anyway, and yet in some books of the Hebrew Bible, the erotic tone of this imagery not only moves from the emotional to the physical, but takes on a much darker hue, casting God as a powerful sexual predator and Israel as a, a, a coquettish young girl. I hope I'm saying that right. The book of Hosea offers a vivid example. Here, Israel is a capricious teenager whose sexual lure so intoxicates God, he falls to scheming obsessively and possessively to make her his wife. I will now, I will now seduce her, he says of Israel. I will take her walking into the wilderness and speak to her heart, and there she will cry out. 
These words betray more than the romantic fantasy of a love-struck deity. God's language here marks a shift from passion to threat. In claiming he will seduce her, he uses a Hebrew expression more usually employed in the Hebrew Bible to describe the rape of captive women. And in describing Israel's vocal response, he uses a term that can, that can convey both the noise of sexual gratification and religious joy. God's dangerous sense of sexual entitlement skews his planned attack on the girl into the distorted conviction that she will enjoy her rape and scream in orgasmic ecstasy. This image of sexual violation is unsettling enough, but nowhere in the Bible is the portrayal of God's sex life more disturbing than in two stories in the book of Ezekiel. Like other biblical narrators, Ezekiel reasons that the military defeat and imperial subjugation that befell Yahweh's people in the 6th century BC was a divine punishment for worshiper, worshiping other gods. Here, too, Israel is cast as God's wife, but her whoring after foreign deities provokes her husband's fury and punishment. According to Ezekiel, this is where it gets dark. That I've never heard, I did not know the Bible had anything like this, okay? So get ready. According to Ezekiel, her wanton behavior in marriage is the culmination of a long history of social and sexual deviancy. Their relationship begins in the wilderness, where God finds an abandoned baby girl, her umbilical cord still attached, deliberately cast away from the rest of humanity. You were abhorred on the day of your birth, scorns God, as he reminds her that she had been neither washed of birth blood nor rubbed with protective salt scrub and swaddled. And yet God acknowledges her, commanding her to live and grow. Only when she has obediently matured to puberty does he notice her again. Reminiscing lasciviously about this, sub this subsequent encounter, God comments, your breasts were formed. Your pubic hair had grown. You were naked and bare. I passed by you and looked at you. You were at the age for lovemaking. I spread the corner of my cloak over you and covered your nakedness. I pledged myself to you and entered into a covenant with you. You became mine. The voyeuristic tone to his words is not lost in this English translation, which barely manages to soften the graphic sexual nature of his actions. God's gaze is upon the girl's exposed sexual organs, moving him to cover her genitals, nakedness, with his own. His spreading cloak politely functioning here as an image of his, his mounting her. Much as in the book of Ruth, in which the eponymous heroine urges a sleepy Boaz to have sex with her by spreading the corner of his cloak over her. The sexual euphemisms continue, for it is by penetrating the girl's body that God enters into a binding covenant with her, an unequal power relationship in which the forging of the deity's exclusive and proprietary claim to Israel is presented as the sexual consummation of a man's possession of a bride. You became mine. And she goes on to explain that Jewish and Christian interpreters have tended to soften and sanitize this encounter, either by reductive means so that the episode is merely a metaphor or allegory depicting intense religious intimacy, or by fantasizing that romantic notions of a, of a committed heteronormative love find their archetype in God so that he is the paradigmatic devoted husband. But this is wishful thinking, and it will not do. Ezekiel's story is reflective of a patriarchal masculinist culture in which girls and women tended to be valued and defined in terms of their bodily configurations with men as daughters, sisters, wives, mothers, or sex workers. The biblical God cannot and should not be let off the hook. Here, he is a predatory alpha male whose sexual entitlement ent entirely shapes the identity and fate of this displaced and vulnerable young girl. Indeed, it is only after sex that God formally rehabilitates his young bride by means of actions reminiscent of rituals denied her at birth. He bathes her, washing away the dried blood of birth and the wet blood of puberty, and then rubs her not with salt, but with sacred oil. Her objectification continues as she dresses her, as he dresses her in rich fabrics and puts soft leather sandals on her feet. He decorates her with earrings, a nose ring, bangles, a necklace, and crown, so that she looks like a statue of a goddess in a temple. 
He gives her the ritual foods commonly offered to deities, choice flour, honey, and fragrant oil, and transfers her from the wilderness to civilization where she is rapturously celebrated for the beauty God has bestowed upon her. And here she is fixed, an unspeaking passive ornament of her husband's uh, hegemonic sexualized masculinity. For God, this is a, a fruitful relationship. The girl gives birth to his sons and daughters, God's own worshipers. And it goes on and on and on and on and on, bro. But everything's sexual. And what's really interesting about this is why we know that she's on track with this whole thing. All you got to do is go to Mesopotamia, go to Ugarit. I mean, if you you read it in your Bible, but if you go and you see it in Ugarit, you see it in Mesopotamia, you see it in Greece. Look at Greek myths. Zeus comes down with Alchemini, golden shower. He turns into a golden shower and impregnates her. In some other cases, he rapes her. He transforms into an animal, a bull. And Yahweh is depicted over and over and over as a bull. In fact, there's a passage in the Ugaritic stuff where El is like literally equated with a bull. And he talks about this, does El's penis arouse you talking to Atherot? Oh, does the penis of El, the king, excite you? Does the love organ of the bull arouse you? This is in KTU uh, 1.4 IV, 30, I think that's 4, 35 to 39. All the sources are in a book. Here's another one. After Father Inky had lifted his eyes across the Euphrates, he stood up full of lust like a rampant bull, lifted his penis, ejaculated, and filled the Euphrates with flowing water. By lifting his penis, he brought a bridal gift. The tigress rejoiced in its heart like a great wild bull when it was born. And that's another one. Egypt has tons of these where uh, I actually interviewed Kara Cooney, and she talks about the gods, they ejaculate, put it in their mouth, and then they end up spitting out new life, new gods. I mean, bro. Oh my I'm, god! I'm hey, I thought porn. I thought porn was the one that came up with that, but it's like, no, this is you know, it's spitting <laughs> something is. It's like a, absolutely it's been there for a while. Eh? Here's another one. Francesca knows all too well how people can point the finger to other myths and their sexual bull gods, so she makes sure to mention Yahweh as out as well. Among these high statue deities, it is no surprise to find that Yahweh too was often understood as the divine bull. Bovine language, the Hebrew term abir underlies his biblical designation as the mighty one, a beer of Jacob, who grants genital fertility to the Israelite tribe of Joseph. And in some biblical text, Yahweh's cult statue is said to take the form of a bull or a bull calf. So he, he it walks like a duck. And so for those who want to pretend, the, the, the apologists, the most the modern ones want to go, God is not that. The Bible doesn't teach that. They're full of it, number one. But number two is this. If they're going to apply that kind of reasoning to the God that is depicted in the Bible or this evolution of this God, um, then we should do the same thing with all the other deities as well. Because mm. you that's cherry picking. You cannot without that's, – that's special pleading and cherry picking. Do you know the one religious person that I – could get on board with being that type of religious person is Dr. Dan McCullen. Data over dogma. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's religious himself. People call him a wolf in sheep's clothing because he just because he says it like it is. Yeah. And uh and he and he and he, he brings out the consent consensus scholarship and it pisses everyone off. But he's like, hey, look, I'm not gonna lie. This is what a lot, this is what I don't understand. I don't know how a lot of Christians can flat out lie. They lie to themselves, they lie to to their audience, I don't know how they can do that and then still think that they're good, that they're not going to be right. turn from turn from me. I never knew you. You practice lawlessness. You know what I mean? Like I don't know yeah. how they they think they're just going to be waltzing through the gates of heaven by lying about um about things, especially like young earth creationism stuff. So someone like Dan McClellan, although I don't subscribe to um obviously his faith, I can respect that he separates his faith and his religious uh. uh education a scholarship i i, I love that I th great Perfect. he's in line Amazing. with everything i'm saying he yeah he really agrees yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it's because he's a wolf in sheep's clothing <laughs> i can't believe that <laughs> have you seen those men? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up, man. <laughs> That's oh, such, I just can't believe it. He's like the he's like the oh god, he's the, he's the best guy to, ever. To be um, very honest with you, if I said this before, which I don't see myself ever doing it, but like if I ever became someone who joined a faith again, it would be <laughs> a Dan McClellan type. It would be the kind yeah, who yeah, yeah. doesn't take this stuff data over dogma like this. Yeah, I would yeah. It'd be more like yeah. I don't know. I'm connecting to some group because I feel like I would need to, I don't know. It wouldn't be because Moses really did get the 10 commandments and the, the, the red sea, the sea of reeds really did split. And Jesus really yeah. did rise. By the way, you yeah. were going to ask me about these other books. I never even freaking got around to, but well, like we're having so much fun. It's up to you, man. Well, I do, I do want to quickly go over and we've got like 35 minutes left, but um, if you've got any super chats, make sure you get them in because I'm going to have to cut them off at a certain time. We've got 90 yeah. minutes today. Super um, but, uh, but so the Derek knows everything Christmas special, the, the segment, well, let's just call it the Derek knows stuff Christmas special. I know it's, yeah, yeah. it's hurting you. Derek knows stuff Christmas special. Yeah. Right? What does Derek learn Christmas special? Uh, but last year I asked you about the resurrection, miracles, Jesus returning, mythicism. Uh, I was wondering, has your perspective changed on any of those things? Especially, I want to ask about like, and I want to ask it specifically because this is probably the most interesting to me because it's the it's the part that I think apologists kind of go on about the most. Is um, I say that like like they're an enemy. They're not an enemy. They're just you know a group of people that tend to do things a certain way. Uh, so <laughs> last year I asked you about the resurrection, and. Um, and I go, what do you think happened? What do you think? And you probably won't remember what your answer was. So I'm going to ask you today, maybe subconsciously you've learned something else. What do you think happened on the resurrection? Do you think the body was stolen? Uh, the swoon theory, I think it was. Um, or do, like, do you have an idea of like, was it uh, recorded incorrectly? Like, tell us a little bit about that. And maybe that will touch into the book that you were just mentioning. Uh, I personally, not. just simply put, I personally take the legendary route of Jesus's burial um, and, and the, the, what we have in the accounts of the gospels as legend. Um, I interviewed Robin Faith Walsh once and asked her, Hey, what do you think happened to the body? Right. And this is when she said, the problem was, is even earliest Christians didn't know exactly what happened. So they were, they were wanting to know the same thing. So I tend to think that this is legend. And the reason I think this is legend even though there could have been a missing body, I don't personally think that that's the case. But because this is what my personal thought is here, David, when you go back into the Greek and Roman world, and it's not just my personal thought, for those who don't know, resurrection and reception in early Christianity, Richard C. Miller, I did, an, I did a documentary four and a half hours long on the church is hiding on the origins, the true origins of Christianity. In this Lincoln book, scripture. Huh? Link in description. I always just, just, just so you know, in the book club, there's everything, everything, every book that's ever mentioned, it's, it's there. Mm. And batteries are not included. So what I'm, <laughs> what I'm getting at is that uh, he documents in the Greek and Roman world, how when people's bodies go missing, this mm. was a sign that they had become a God. We have contemporary writings from, um, Kalihari or Kalerho, however you want to pronounce that, where it's a novel and the girl goes missing. She's actually taken by a bunch of guys and like supposedly she's supposed to be in this tomb and they come and she's not dead. And these grave robbers take her body and of course they take off. And he immediately responds when he gets there, not knowing that she's still alive and she was taken off by some guy in Persia or something. Um mm -hmm that he goes, which of you of the gods um, wanted her and, and envied me and took her from me? Like, like he knew that she had been taken in his mind to become a goddess. You find this over and over and over. And there's um, chapter two of his book. He lists from an alphabetical order, like A to Z, all of these different gods. There's 77, I think it is, that are listed in chapter two of this book. And um, I can't even pronounce half of them because they're all Greek names and some names I'd never heard of. But like Heracles and uh, Bernice, queen of Ptolemaic Egypt, um, Asclepius, uh, various fables and historical people that you'll find where their bodies go missing. Apollonius of Tyana, um, 
Ariadne, Aristius, son of Apollo, Alexander the Great, Aeneas, son of Aphrodite, Alcamini, prince of My Mycenae and Tyrenes. Um, the list goes on and on and on as you go through. And most of them, 50-something of these people, their bodies went missing. 50-something of them, their bodies went missing, and they all are either gods or goddesses. That's why you get these like, okay, why was Alexander the Great in one of the stories trying to make his body disappear by, by drowning in a river? He tried to drown himself, according to one account, to end up getting taken off by the river and disappear. He mm. wanted, according to this account, people to then go, he's become a god. And in another mm. account, he really did become a god. The fact that his body would go missing. So I personally take the Gospels as legendary accounts. But if you do want to pretend that these are history, and I say pretend not because they aren't or there isn't a kernel, I don't think it's verifiable. There's no way to test this in to know. But yeah. you can get to it, you can get them to say like, hey, these tombs seem to be described somewhat accurate to what actual first, ten, first century tombs look like. So if that somehow nudges someone into thinking they knew a little too much about tombs in that period, in that place, and therefore it makes them think this might be more uh, historical because of the verisimilitude, okay, let's go down the path of assuming he really did go missing. Would the disciples have removed his body and taken it off and disposed of it a different way? I think so. And Christians don't. They go, oh, they would never die for something. Well, if you just read about the Caesars, they had a public example where they made a wax effigy of the Caesar and they would burn it in front of the public after the Caesar would die. And once the fire, just like Heracles, once the fire burned down, there's no bones, mm. no bones. That was a sign that his body had been removed because bones remain in a normal fire. So why is there no bones? Well, they created a wax effigy and they had a private setting where the family actually buried the, the king or the emperor at the time. And yeah. this is temporary to Jesus, contemporary to the times of the origins of Christianity. And I'm yeah. looking at examples going, yep, okay. Would they have stolen the body if we say that's historical? Of course they would have. Of course they would have. And people go, well, what would be the motivating factor behind it? Have you ever heard of power? Think yeah. about it. You're one of the guys. Has anyone ever heard of Joseph Smith? I mean, yeah. think about well, not let's, let's, yeah. let's say that they are, they do steal the body because right. they're expecting him to resurrect. Let's say that is the case. They expect him to resurrect. We want to get it out of the, out of the hands of the Romans or whoever's, you know, wait, we're going to take the body. Mm -hmm. He doesn't resurrect. Uh, okay, let's, let's just not tell anyone about that part. And then the, all these you know, legends start, you know, people start saying, oh, I started seeing Jesus down the road. I saw Jesus, I saw Jesus. And it's, it's, it's uh, another thing is like, you know, have you, you there's a there's a preacher called Peter Popoff who literally scammed his entire audience of millions of dollars. Right, he's he still got a church. He he was found to be a fraud. And he still got a church. People still stand by him. Why? There's this thing called the sunk cost fallacy. If you're if you you can't Christians in one breath say there was this community of believers persecuted. They sold all their belongings and right. gave it to the church. They've given everything to this cause. And then it turns out not to be true. What happens? What do we see when people do that? They, they, they don't, people predict the end of the world and they sell their belongings. And then they, what do they do? Actually, we're off by a couple of years. It's going to be a few years down the track. Like people don't just go, you know what? I'm going to bail on this community that I've been a part of, that we've gone through all this traumatic stuff together. You know, they, they, this, they, there's so many reasons why people would still continue to be Christians and still try to promote this this new form of uh, which, by the way, and Gnostic Informer goes over this in his recent mm -hmm. documentary. Christianity was whack at the start. It was very, very different to what what, what we know. And so, like, there's yeah. a lot of competing ideas. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I I just it just doesn't it makes sense. It, like, I'm not saying that is the case, but like, if yeah. that what like back to Hume. What's more likely that there is this son of God and that all these holes in the Bible will just figure out a way to make them not holes in the future and all, you know, and really like it just it doesn't or it was just natural. Explanation. You bring up something that I figure I'd, I think it's important emphasizing because I didn't really know this before I met Richard C. Miller and went into his work on resurrection reception. He pointed out that at this time in the Greek and Roman and Jewish world, gods were physical. Okay, they had mm. physical bodies. They just weren't 
seen by people. They hid. They usually kept their bodies hidden. But here's what's interesting. A ghost or a phantom does not have a physical body. And one of the ways you would tell someone in a story that someone is a god is that they can go through walls, they can teleport, transport, go through walls, and yet be physical. This was a clear mm. sign that they were they were actually a god, not a phantom or a ghost, which is why you see in the Gospels them jabbing at, I am not a ghost, I am not a phantom, I'm eating with you, here I am with you, touch me. Well, in Thomas's case, I never realized this. Christians love to make a big deal out of this point and go, he's part of the Trinity and Jesus did claim to be God. And the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of John, where Thomas shows up and he says, My Lord and my God. We all know the famous passage. Touch me, feel me, know that I am. Like I'm I'm here, I'm alive, and I'm physical. Immediate reaction was, My Lord, my God. Now, why did he have that immediate reaction? Because at that time, physical bodies that would transport or, or teleport or go through things like that and yet remain physical was evidence of them being, being God. And we see this in Matthew. Because when you go to the Gospel of Matthew, they come to the tomb. The stone is not rolled away. The stone is mm -hmm. there. And yet, Jesus is not in the tomb. Well, then how the hell did he get out? Mm. God, because once they roll the stone away, he's not there. So it's proof to them that this man is divine. He's divine. And it, this all the way through the Gospels, the evidence of him being divine, the body going missing, is a well-known, legendary, fictional trope. And did it play into the history of people manufacturing evidence? Yeah, they did it with Caesar. They purposely have the wax effigy, effigy melt. They go, oh, he became a god. Of course, the Senate was the one who ultimately ruled, but they also depended on the people. If the people wanted this guy to become a god and the Senate hated him, Julius Caesar, they were going to go with the uh, consensus or they were going to get their asses handed to them by the overwhelming populace. And that did not mm. stop. They made him into a god. Uh, so there's, there's so many interesting things to go into uh, but this, I would say, this book really changed my understanding on Jesus and Christianity and even going into Paul. Paul already has a, a set-up legend. And we can look at other examples from writers who talk about um, Lucian of Samosata, the, uh, the one who's the satirist. He talks mm. about Peregrinus, who was a Christian. He was like worshipped by Christians. Like this guy was somebody, according to... Lucian, and he left Christianity and joined a philosophy. I can't remember which philosophy. He met his ascesis, as Miller would tell me, that pretty much meaning I've made it. I am at my peak philosophical zen. I'm at the peak. It's time mm. for me to prove that. I'm going to burn myself alive in front of everybody on a pyre. And you might go, that sounds stupid. It is stupid, but in that time, Heracles and others who were famous gods in the Greek and Roman world, and the Romans went out on a pyre, and to show that you really are that serious and dedicated, he goes up, he burns himself on the pyre. I'm butchering this, but it's something like this. Lucian's on his way to go watch Peregrinus commit suicide in front of everybody and claim I did this because of the gods and I'm right and I'm ready to go up and be part of the platonic ultimate good and blah, 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 whatever it is. He says on the way, people kept bothering him to go, Hey, what happened? Or he was coming from there and he saw what happened and they kept bugging him. Well, what happened? What happened? So finally he said he was annoyed and he said, all right. So I started telling them this Phoenix, once he burned the Phoenix rose and ascended to Mount Olympus. And like he gave this bullshit story and then he goes home the next day. He's out in the market. Some old man comes up to him and is like, I saw, I'm an eyewitness. I saw the Phoenix ascend to Mount Olympus from his body. And Lucian says, whether this is satire or not, it tells you the mindset of the people at the time, how superstitious, even at the face of lying, they were. That he And we do it today. So I don't even want to hear people who try to go, oh, that's not true, the apologists that do this. 
But he points out, I made this lie up 24 hours ago. And here this man's already circulating that he witnessed something that I made up. What's that tell you? It tells you, can I really trust a book written by a cult leader who's getting your money in Corinth, in Philippi, in, in Galatia, and handing you money to a cult leader named Paul, who's going to bring it to some people called the poor over here in Jerusalem, and you're actually going to believe that everything they're telling you is actually the truth? Well, why would they lie, Derek? They would never tell us lies. Well, you're just an ignorant person. I can't help you. <laughs> You might as well give to Peter Popoff, okay? Like, what do we do? <laughs> Man, uh, someone someone commented, um, how long to, to testify makes a video on a uh, video about this? Um, <laughs> I love testify. Like, he's a, his content's great, but I don't agree with his perspectives. But you know, he makes he makes it, his videos it, are actually well done. It's look, crazy look. because they like there's such a literal in his view when he does these little mockeries of Dionysus and stuff, I laugh. I think it's funny. And I'm like, ah, and I'm in the comments being funny, good sport that I am. But in reality, how little their imagination really is on understanding how literature at this time worked and how mm. they would imitate and model new constructed stories based on the well-established mythical legendary tropes of the period from Romulus, Heracles, um, Alexander the Great. Those are the major three in the Greek and Roman world. And of course, in the Jewish world, you had Moses, Elijah, Jonah. These figures were huge and they would imitate them using some of that Alexander the Great, Romulus and Heracles mythology and incorporate, and others, Asclepius with the healing, Dionysus with the turning water into wine. This is clearly a trope, but... Mm. Jesus and it's real. This is true. Of course. Of course. Um, got a couple of super chats just quickly. I know we're all, well, we're actually over time. Um, but just before we do that, guys, two more episodes for the year. Not so erudite in a few days. So we're, we're, we're cramming them in. This will be a really interesting for geez, 47 hours. Um, this can be a really awesome episode. Um, and then we also have the 100 episode live stream with some special guests coming on in three days. So make do not miss this one. Do not miss this one live. I'm telling you, some some crazy stuff's going to go down. It's going to be it's going to be fun. Um, but Derek, I have a couple of super chats. One yeah. digital Hammurabi. Uh, let me just drop that. Sorry. Look at these two atheists. So typical. Just one question. Do you have the spirit of God? No. They can't know anything about my Bible. <laughs> All right, don't tell right. me, but he got me. He got yeah. me. Got he got me. me. Yeah. No, but, I mean, I'm not even kidding you. I was either. already got by when um, Cameron Bertuzzi said that God was perfect. By the way, God is perfect. When he said that, I was like, oh, fuck. Atheism destroyed. <laughs> That's it. It's done. It's done. This <laughs> it's anthropomorphic done. God that raped Israel in, I in the book of Hosea... <laughs> He's right. He's perfect. I mean, he's just <laughs> perfect. You know, the one from Ezekiel that took the little baby and told it to grow pubic hair and then he would mess with her. That God's perfect. You know, what a wonderful deity, yeah. Cameron. What exactly. a wonderful deity. Yeah. Oh, and slavery was perfect. I actually responded right. to that and I said that slavery was perfect. I said, by the way, slavery was perfect. <laughs> John and then Cameron I deleted it. Because, uh, sorry. <laughs> go, go. What were you saying? No, Joshua Bowen Nels, I'm glad someone like him who's really focused on slavery because that is such a moral conundrum, right? Like we yeah. all are living in a time where the impacts of centuries of it are still showing. There's trauma mm. still here. And the fact that apologists play these games, it just mm. tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about the Kool-Aid that belief God, drink God, God, God was working <laughs> within his time and he, <laughs> he was working within his time and it was just he had to he had to do it because his hands were tired and you know like he could say don't eat shrimp but he couldn't tell people not to own other humans' right. property. <laughs> I killed Earl. <laughs> Thank you for the five deep pinks memberships. And uh, that's amazing. And uh, Soul Rebel AZ, thank you for the two little super chat. Any book recommendations on Passover, Old Testament versus New Testament? Passover, I don't know a specific book. I wish I did on just dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting one because 
I imagine there's an evolution from my research and Kip Davis. I thought I saw was in the chat. He could give me like a, tell me if I'm hot or cold here, Kip, but there's an evolution. It seems of Passover itself from what appears to be a very ancient agricultural ceremonial thing that people in Phoenicia, Canaan, potentially all throughout the Levant practiced that eventually picked up narratives that we later would call the Exodus with Moses and the firstborn children and stuff. And they found ways to kind of, I guess you'd say fuse those together over time. But as far as the new Testament goes, um, you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a very Jewish established period where Jews, the religion of Judaism is fully in effect. And so Passover is something even Jesus attended. I mean, there's no, according to the text, of course, I can't say what Jesus actually himself did, but the text say he is actually practicing and participating in Passover. And there are some scholars who think there might be some other kind of replacement stuff, replacement theology happening, where some of these older or Jewish um, practices like Passover, um, sacrifice, all these things, Jesus just so happens to be the one who fulfills them and stuff. So I don't know a book though, like a specific book that deals with it. And my hot or cold, it was a pastoral festival that was combined in Deuteronomy with an agricultural festival of spring rites and Exodus. So, okay. I think I was kind of warm. It may not have been hot, but I was classic, warm. classic Kip coming in with facts and logic. I mean, how history. The, who does he think he is? I mean, he's Canadian. Like, come on. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, come on, eh? You know, you know all about it, right? You know all about it. <laughs> about it. I, I, I I'm not going to rip on. Uh, I'm not going to rip on Canadians. I have, uh, you know, Australian accent. Um, but let me just say, go subscribe uh, to Myth Vision. Everyone subscribe to Myth Vision. But if you if you hear you subscribe to Myth Vision, even my mum is subscribed to Myth Vision. Go over subscribe if you're not. Go check out the documentary. It's amazing. Watch it three times. Send it to your fundamentalist auntie, uh, and make sure you subscribe to Deep Drinks. We are 200 subscribers away from getting to 5,000. Let's see if we can get to 500,000 by the end of the year. All right, we can do it. 500,000 subscribers. Let's no. Let's go 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. No. 5,000 okay. subscribers by the year. Let's try and do it. And let's end on one last super chat. Yeah. Nitty. $10. Thank you so much. We are Deep Vision. I like that. Should we start a podcast called Deep Vision? Oh. <laughs> deep in some shit vision. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, it's been it's been amazing. Um, as always, have Derek on. Thank you, Derek, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it, this, is, this has been great. We're going to rename this to the Derek Knows Stuff Christmas Special for next year. And uh, <laughs> thank you for changing the name. You know, when you were less of a, when you were so, when you weren't so big of a content creator, it was like even funnier. But now that you're like, it's like all of a sudden now you, you're becoming a bit of an internet celebrity. So it's like, it's not, it's not cool. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, I don't all like, right. I seriously do think, um, you know, I don't like that. Personally, I know you're joking, <laughs> but I really don't like that because I, I interview scholars. I am not the scholar, right? I wanted, I but I love the freedom to explore ideas and stuff. And uh, so there's a there's a privilege. I'm I'm very privileged to be at the feet of some brilliant minds and learn from various people who disagree with each other on many things, but overwhelmingly have a lot more in common. And then walk away and then d dissect it or digest it and see how it makes sense to me and and then also explore areas that maybe most people don't in certain fields of biblical studies explore that's just not something that it's not that they wouldn't it's just not the thing that their school maybe particularly is trying to focus on and explore yeah. and that's what richard c miller pointed out with his book resurrection and reception where did i put it i put it right here that the point is not many New Testament scholars, if any, are really doing classicist New Testament scholarship. You got to go deep into the Greek Roman world in order to recognize its impact on Christianity because they only want to look at Jewish antecedents. And I get why, but they're ignoring. Mm. There, there's an ignoring of the facts of what's going on simultaneously at this emergence of Christianity between the Greek 
and the Roman and Jewish world. And the New Testament, it just makes me think, here are these Gentiles that are entering into the movement who probably are funding a lot of this, just like they did many of the synagogues among the di diaspora. And, and they're moving into this movement and they're probably bringing ideas or at least somebody's bending something in some way, in a Hellenistic way to get them to come in. And so uh, you don't get that often. It's not the most common approach to New Testament studies. And that's what mm. I think, you know, I like to explore stuff that isn't the most common idea out there. Mm. And that's what you do the best. You're, you are the best. Like you, your stuff is incredible. Thank you. Thank brother. you so much, Derek. It's a pleasure Thank as you. always. And I'll see you guys in 47 hours.